All right, it's very good. Revelations. This is part nine tonight, believe it or not. It's a definitely the longest series I've ever done. All right, so Revelation 21. I have to click on that first. There we go. The new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem. So last week, we talked about the millennial reign of Christ, which anybody know how long that is? Long time. The millennial reign? The millennium? 40, how long is the millennium? 1,000. 1,000 years, millennium, okay. And prior to that, there were seven years of tribulation. But just before the seven years, there's an event called the rapture that takes place, which we're all very glad about. The church goes up, and we see stuff happening on earth from a distance. And uh, tribulation, and great tribulation for seven years. The nation of Israel uh, gets saved by the millions, uh, as well as other nations. But then after the seven years, Jesus comes back, with us and he establishes his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years but then at the end of that we see this new heaven new earth and new jerusalem which we're going to be looking at tonight just to give you a bit of an idea of the size of uh, of the new jerusalem that's the united states there and that square is the size of the new jerusalem okay so contrary to what some people think that only a few people are going to make it to heaven <laughs> there's going to be a lot there okay <laughs> There's going to be many, many millions, if not billions, in heaven, having good fellowship. Okay, so Revelation 21 opens with John's description of the new heaven, the new earth and the new Jerusalem, containing no large bodies of water, that new earth is larger in land area than the former earth. Okay, so there's not going to be, the earth as we know it has many large seas, isn't it? We're about, what, a third land, two-thirds sea. Well, that's not going to be the case with the new earth. There will be some water, but not large bodies of water. I think I started recording. Yes, I did. Okay, a couple of verses there. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is Revelation 21. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Only righteous people live on the new earth. The following verse categorizes the unrighteous people who will suffer eternally in the lake of fire. Okay, So at this stage, the earth is cleansed. Okay, All the ungodly have been assigned um, to the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8 says the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We talked about the difference between spiritual death and the second death or the eternal death. Okay, Spiritual death is when somebody doesn't know the Lord, but after somebody is judged and sent to the lake of fire without Jesus, then that's eternal death. Okay, That's the second death. So each of the letters to the seven churches of Asia contains statements to the overcomer, as does the following passage. God has amazing plans for the company of overcomers. And I think somebody talked about that tonight already, didn't they, about overcoming. And that's the theme of the book of Revelation, is a real encouragement to overcome, not by our own works, but by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. Verse 3 of Revelation 21, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Which was always God's heart, wasn't it? God is a father. He wanted a family, and that's, he wanted to come down and walk with Adam and, in the cool of the afternoon. So that never changed. And so God's cleansed this whole process now and bring it back full circle. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There should be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Isn't that good news? Come on, we need a bit of yes. audience participation here. Yes. <laughs> Some voice. <laughs> okay, Revelation 21, 5 to 7. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. 
He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And just once again on that theme of overcoming, I think, you know, the encouragement in the book of Revelation is, is there's something on the inside of you that makes you want to be an overcomer, doesn't it? To overcome the enemy and, you know, all his schemes and all his plans. And particularly when you see what God's set in front of us, you know, we have a vision of something absolutely awesome uh, to be an overcomer for. So the New Jerusalem, verse 9 of Revelation 21 Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And once again, we mentioned the jasper stone, like a fiery red kind of a stone, a real brilliant textured stone, quite brilliant to look at. I think I've got a picture later on somewhere. Verse 12, also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. So got an angel guarding each gate and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Okay, so 12 gates, 12 names. Three on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we have that double 12 again that we talked about earlier in the book. 12 from the old, 12 from the new. The bride is the new Jerusalem occupied by God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the body of Christ. Okay, so specifically, we're not talking about the general new earth. We're just talking about the new Jerusalem at this stage is occupied by the Father, the Son, and the body of Christ. And I'm sure the Holy Spirit's around there somewhere too. <laughs> now, this is an interesting um, note that Hilton Sutton says, the church is not the bride, but the body of Christ of which Jesus is the head. Okay, as the body of Christ, we receive the new Jerusalem clearly called the Lamb's bride, his wife. And so Revelation just clears that up. It tells us exactly what the bride is. The bride is the new Jerusalem. And I know that's contrary to what some of us have thought and been taught, but this is what the Bible says, okay? The bride is the new Jerusalem, which is occupied by the Father, the Son, and the body of Christ. Okay, the occupants. We know that a large company of Old and New Testament glorified saints occupy this beautiful city. When we say glorified saints, we're talking about the ones that received a, a new body. They no longer have an earthly body. They have a spiritual body like Jesus had when he came back. And remember, he walked through a wall, but he also ate fish. And so uh, he could still eat with a glorified body. There are 12 gates, three on each side of the city. And the names of the 12 tribes of Israel are written over the gates. And the wall of the city has 12 foundations in which the names of the Lamb's 12 apostles are written. Okay, let's look at the size of this. Does anybody know what the size of the New Jerusalem is? I mean, we saw the map, but anybody know specifically how many, how many miles it is? It's quite big. He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reeds 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. So this city is a cube. Okay, so it's, it's, so, many, it's so many miles this way, so many miles this way, and it's the same miles upwards. So it's a perfect cube. Now, the size of the city is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles deep, and 1,500 miles high. <laughs> For all we know, it could be a multi-layered city. And so when you think of 1,500 miles, um, there could be several floors to the city because we're talking 1,500 miles high as well. So pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. So that's... Um, in, in terms of kilometres, we must be pushing uh, about 2,000 kilometres Okay, each direction and 2,000 kilometers high. 
So the New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles square, not square miles, okay? 1,500 miles square. This is the equivalent of 2,250,000 square miles. Okay, so there's a lot of room in there for a lot of people. <laughs> Los Angeles covers about 500 square miles. So that gives you, that's the biggest city in the world. So 500 square miles, we're talking about 2,250,000 square miles. Okay, God's a big God, isn't he? <laughs> God likes big, big cities. The New Jerusalem is also 1,500 miles high. I mean, that's hard for us to comprehend because we don't have any buildings that high. I mean, that's huge. That's absolutely massive. That would be like standing New Zealand up almost, wouldn't it, probably? <laughs> standing New Zealand straight from south to north. I mean, that's just amazing. Jesus said that his father's house will be filled. Okay, None of this remnant theology. There's just going to be a few rattling around. <laughs> Jesus said his father's house will be filled. It'll be sweet fellowship. Okay, the city wall is extremely tall, all right? So we have this, this cube of the city, but around that, the perimeter, we also have a wall. And he measured the wall 144 cubits. Now, a cubit is a foot and a half, okay? So it comes to roughly 220 feet high. So if you know you talk about a wall around a palace, well, this wall is no small wall. This is 220 feet high, okay? I don't know, the length of our section is probably 100 feet. So that gives you a bit of an idea um, how high this wall is. This is about 216 feet, equivalent to the height of a 22-story building. All right? So this is just the perimeter fence. Okay? <laughs> God does it all big. Okay, it's elegance. What's it going to look like? The construction of its wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. You know, it's hard for us to comprehend, isn't it? You know, just have a city made of pure gold. I mean, <laughs> it's just going to be absolutely amazing. And the wall made of jasper. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, and the third chalcony, the fourth emerald, and, and so on. Names all the different stones. The fifth sardonyx and sardius and chrysolite and beryl and topaz and something and jacinth and amethyst. I mean, if it was you and I, we'd just put a bit of concrete down, but not in God's kingdom. It's got to be precious stones. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. And... Um, once again, when you think about a gate, don't think about a normal gate, because if we're talking about a city that's 1,500 miles high, I mean, the gate's usually the same height as the wall, isn't it? And so you're talking about a big pearl, the pearly gates. All right, so a 1,500-mile stretch, and, and on that stretch you've got three pearly gates on each side of the square. Just going to be uh, just amazing. I don't think even Hollywood could really do justice to what it's going to be like. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Twelve amazing foundations, each formed from a solid precious stone, support the wall made of jasper. Oh, there's my picture. That's the picture of a jasper stone. Okay, So it just gives you a little bit of an idea what it might look like. It's a fiery red stone. Each foundation is garnished, garnished with the stones of the other 11, and the city is made of pure gold. Each gate made of a single pearl in a wall that runs 1,500 miles in one direction and stands about 22 stories high will be amazing. The streets are not paved with gold, as some songs declare. Some of those old hymns, you know, the streets paved with gold, but they are made of pure gold, the whole street. Pure gold. When we're talking pure gold, they say that pure gold is actually yeah. lets the light through. It's clear because it's refined so much that all the impurities are out of it. You know, even the finest gold we have today, um, the reason it's opaque is because it has impurities in it. But pure gold doesn't, and it's actually clear. 
Okay, the temple, I saw no temple in it for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. God created us for his pleasure. The overcoming believers who occupy the new Jerusalem are the ones who have brought him the most pleasure. And so he moves right in with them. Okay, God wants to go where it's fun. (laughs) He's just like, you know, that's where we get our nature from, isn't it? From the Father. He just wants to be where the action is. He wants to be where he's welcomed and accepted and celebrated. God and Jesus dwell in the same city with us. Because of the personal presence of God and Jesus, there is no need for a place of worship in the new Jerusalem. Okay, So there won't be the Methodist church, the Baptist church, the Catholic church, (laughs) the Presbyterians. All right, We'll just be one body under God, all right, in the New Jerusalem. But this should not be interpreted to mean that today's believers need no house of worship. Okay, Knowing human nature better than man does, God has ordained that we Christians should meet in specific houses to worship. Okay, And we see that don't we, from the book of Acts. They literally met in houses and meeting places. The Apostle Paul declares that as we see the day of the Lord approaching, we ought to assemble ourselves together all the more. Okay, Hebrews 10.25. Okay, the light of the city. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Okay, we know that God is light, isn't he? Everything about God, his word is light. Jesus is light. So there'll be no need for sun or moon. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. So this starts to give us a bit of a clue that there's still things happening outside of this new Jerusalem. Okay, there's going to be the nations that are saved with their kings. Now, the source of energy for light in the city is the glory of God and the Lamb, Jesus. They outshine the sun. Remember um, when uh, Saul of Tarsus had his encounter? He saw a light that was brighter than the noonday sun. And that's saying something. The noonday sun in in Israel apparently is as bright as anywhere in the world. And yet he saw a light brighter than the noonday sun and it blinded him for several days. And so we're not going to get blinded, but that just gives us a taste of what sort of light will be in the city. The righteous people of the new earth walk in its life, light that should be, and go in and out through its gates. Okay, the gates are always opened. These righteous nations have kings who at appropriate times bring their glory and honor into the city. Okay, now we, we as the church with glorified bodies, we actually dwell in the city, but there will be nations, saved nations with kings that are outside of the city and they're going to bring the glory and honor and wealth of the nations at certain times into the city. These will be times of rejoicing and celebration. The people will joyfully anticipate these times as we do our major holidays. Okay, what about the righteousness of the city? Verse 25, Revelation 21. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there shall be no night there. I had somebody um, ask a question on one of my YouTubes about, you know, how who created God, etc., and things like that. And I said, well, God is from everlasting to everlasting. And he said, yeah, but what about time? He said, I can't believe that there's no time in heaven. And we just had a little bit of a debate back and forward trying to answer uh, questions for him. And I said, well, he said, I said, just imagine being in a place, there's order, but there's no time. There's sequence, things happen in a sequence, things happen in order, but that can happen without time. If you've got no day or night, you don't need time, do you? It's just like you're in eternity, but things can still happen in order. Okay, but I didn't hear from him after that. So I don't know if he got it or what. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, verse 27 reveals that those people who defile, work abominations or lie have already been cast into the lake 
of fire. They have no part with the new heaven, the new earth, or the new Jerusalem. Okay, Once God um, pushes the reset button, there will be no contamination on the planet. Okay. Combined together on the new, R, new earth are a righteous people in earthly bodies like Adam and Eve before the fall, the nation of Israel fully restored during the millennium, occupied by the natural seed of Abraham in earthly bodies, and the church, the only inhabitants with glorified bodies who live in the new Jerusalem and continue serving as administrators of Jesus' everlasting kingdom. And so when you look at that, um, there's a great advantage to being part of the church, isn't there? And when we talk about the nation of Israel there, obviously there's going to be many in Israel who are now born again and will go up in the rapture with a glorified body and they will be part of the church. Okay? But the church, uh, the born again church, are the only inhabitants who live in the new Jerusalem with glorified bodies. Okay, we must keep in mind that everything that God has done was and is perfect. God preserves every phase of his perfect plan. He does so in the millennium by having righteous people and earthly bodies occupying the new earth. Okay, so think back to the origin of creation, Adam and Eve, earthly bodies placed on the earth. That was God's original design. God is going to have that again. He's going to have the nations uh, righteous people that actually live on the earth. He has the seed of Abraham creating a perfect nation called Israel. Remember, that's part of his plan too, wasn't it? He chose Israel. And so he's going to restore Israel and have his way once again. But he has a third company made of believers with glorified bodies, establishing that we, through Jesus Christ, overcome Satan. Okay, once again, that theme of the overcomers. Right. Now, this was stuff that I've learned from Hilton Sutton's book. I, hadn't, I didn't actually know any of this stuff, so I was quite surprised to read some of it. But this is what the Bible teaches us, okay? these three different companies. Okay, so Revelation chapter 22, which is the final chapter of Revelation. So it looks like we're going to be all right. We've just got a few more slides. So uh, the river of life running down. Uh, the middle of the city. I didn't put too many pictures up because some of the, um, the pictures on Google are just so lame <laughs> compared to what <laughs> the description in Revelation that it would be better just not to show anything. You know, some of them just so, show really small cities and things like that and you think, nah, it's just nowhere near. So Revelation 22 verse 1, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So the description of the clear water of the river of life flowing from God's throne show there is absolutely no pollution in the New Jerusalem or on the new earth, okay? Absolutely none. I mentioned last week, didn't I, about the astronauts, that um, originally the astronauts going up into outer space used to come back through a quarantine process um, because they thought, well, there might be some bugs out there that they don't want to introduce to the earth. But after a while, they found out there's actually no bacteria out in outer space. There's no germs, there's no bugs, there's no bacteria, no sickness, no disease. <laughs> the closer you get to heaven, the less of that stuff there is. So the Golden Street in New Jerusalem is actually a boulevard. Anybody know what a boulevard is? It's like you have a river flowing down the middle of the street. So that'll be pretty cool, won't it? A boulevard. The river of life flows down the middle of it, the street. And the trees of life, the only species of tree in the entire city, grow on both banks. So you get the picture of the trees are growing, their roots are down into this, this water of life. The tree bears 12 kinds of fruit and produces every month. Now we're talking about heaven now, aren't we? <laughs> As opposed to earth. Every month. 12 kinds of fruit on one tree. <laughs> so you don't need 12 trees, you just have one tree with 12 fruit. 
all your favourite fruit. Mango, mangoes, peaches, nectarines, apricots, pineapples, pawpaws. Its fruit is to be eaten by the overcoming believers. That's us, hey. <laughs> we get to eat in heaven. You know, some people have asked, do, do we eat in heaven because of this glorified body? Well, we do. Praise God, we eat the fruit of these trees. <laughs> the food of heaven. This will get people's attention. So some people ask, will we eat in heaven? Be a lot of people would be disappointed if we didn't. Yes, we will eat, first of all, the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we haven't talked about a lot, but that was during the tribulation period in heaven. So the marriage supper of the Lamb, during the millennium we will eat, and in the New Jerusalem. Following his resurrection, Jesus, in his glorified body, ate fish and bread with his disciples. In heaven we will not eat because we need nourishment or because we're hungry, but we'll have the pleasure of eating God's special fruit of the tree of life. Okay, so we basically just eat for pleasure, like we do now. <laughs> and we won't put on weight, so that'll be cool too, won't it? Eat as much as you like or as little as you like. <laughs> okay, the eighth unknown of the book of Revelation referring to the leaves of the trees for the healing of the nations. Okay, So we don't have a lot of information or understanding about that verse. But we do know that everyone who eats of the tree of life will have unending health. The nations of this verse were the ones which occupy the new earth and have access to the city. The gates are open, they're able to come in and, uh, and eat of the, the leaves of these trees for the healing of the nations. So since there is no sickness or disease, the leaves maintain life as they would have for Adam. Okay, there will be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. You know, remember the, um, we didn't talk much about it, but the mark of the beast. You know, Satan can't come up with any new tricks. He just copies and perverts everything that God does. You know, God has this, um, wants to have a seal, his name on our foreheads. And of course, the enemy tries to, to do likewise. So the mark of the beast comes into play. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. And don't forget this was written 2,000 years ago. You know, a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. A day is like a thousand years. So for us it's been 2,000 years, but for God it's just been two days. Behold, I'm coming quick. He says, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming back in two days. <laughs> Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now with verse 7, the prophecy that began in Revelation 4 closes. Okay. With verses 8 to 21 conclude John's covering letter of Revelation 1. Remember he began that covering letter to all the seven churches and to all the churches. And, of course, he gives the prophecy, and now he's going back to close his covering letter to the seven churches. Now, I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Okay, now, his heart was right, but the moment you start to worship an angel, you're going to get rebuked. <laughs> and he said to me, see that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. We don't worship angels. Angels are servants. They minister to us, but we don't worship them. The theme of this book is... Jesus. Jesus. What, what's our theme for 2014? Jesus. Jesus is the theme yeah. for 2014. Okay, the theme of this book is Jesus. The book reveals the last act of God's master performance. 
Okay, remember we said Revelation never was about the Antichrist or the false prophet or the beast. Revelation is about God. Revelation is about Jesus and, and God bringing this thing to a close. So it emphasizes that we are to worship the only true God who created heaven and earth. Okay, by now, people that don't worship God are in the lake of fire. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Peter, James, John and Paul. The God who gave us the only Savior, Jesus Christ. The God who provides for those who accept his Son. Worship God, not man. Worship the Creator, not the creature, nor money, nor things. Okay, Revelation is not sealed. Verse 10. He said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Okay, he was saying it's only a couple more days to go. And so he said, don't seal the book up. So Revelation was never sealed. Daniel's prophecies were sealed until the time of the end. But that seal has been lifted. Okay, that was lifted um, when John received the revelation. Daniel's prophecies. The revelation was never sealed. John writes, the time is at hand. This statement also appears in Revelation 1 verse 3. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. So the prophecy in this book will not change all unrighteous people into righteous ones or afford the righteous any greater tools than are already available. The prophecy will eventually affect all people. That's absolutely true. But whether or not they change their course, the prophecy must be declared. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And uh, if you don't have a, a right interpretation of that, you'll start to have, think, you know, judgment once again. All oh, my bad things, God's recorded all my bad deeds in a book and he's going to get me when I get to heaven. Well, it's not like that at all. Reward is actually a good thing, okay? There are two kinds of judgment, good and bad, in favor or against. The judgment seat of Christ is favorable. I mentioned that as believers, we do not attend the great white throne judgment, Okay. Because we've already been judged, our sins have been judged in Christ. But there is a thing called the judgment seat of Christ, which is actually a bad translation. The word judgment is the Greek word bema. And the bema was actually um, like part of an Olympic Games where they actually received their medals and their rewards. So it's not a judgment seat at all. It's a reward. It's a place of reward. And so we get rewards based on the things, the works that we've done whilst we've been born again, okay? Things that God has called us to do. So when one is raptured, he has already been judged righteous and victorious, ready for the event, okay? So no one will be raptured unless God's favor is already upon him. When Jesus comes to catch up his own, he brings their rewards with him. This is a judgment of rewards So go to work. Okay, Remember that verse that says we have been created for good works. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared. Those are the works we follow his plan for our life that will be rewarded. Okay, Remember it says our works could be burned up, but we would still be saved as one who escapes from the fire. Okay, But if we build, you know, gold, silver and precious stones, those works will endure And we will be rewarded for those works. So it's possible to do no good works and still go to heaven, but there won't be any rewards for those works. So let's go to work now. Let's find out God's plan. And we are finding out God's plan for our life. Put our hand to the to the works, you know, by the grace of God. And we're going to get rewards for those works. You know, it's pretty amazing what God gives us grace so that we can do stuff. And then he rewards us for the things that he graced us to do. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? (laughs) So there's no pending judgment for a believer. Jesus has been judged for us, but there is rewards. Okay, verse 13, we're just bringing this to a close. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first 
and the last. So, and he's saying that with an authority because he literally has finished that part, that part of creation, that part of eternity. Blessed are those who do his commandments. Um, just interestingly on that, you know, commandments brings up that kind of law connotation. I looked up in my Bible and there's a study note in the margin and um, the, the best translation of the Greek Testament, the NU, actually translate it, blessed are those who've washed their robes, which is very different from doing the commandments, isn't it? So some, somehow a little bit of law got put into some of the other translations, but the best Greek translation says, blessed are those who wash their robes. And how do we wash our robes? What detergent do we use to, to wash our robes? The blood of Jesus. Absolutely, the blood of Jesus. Okay. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. It couldn't be by following commandments because that would come back to works, wouldn't it? And it's not by works, it's by what Jesus did. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. come. And let him who hears say, come. come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take water of life. Take the water of life freely. Hallelujah. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Okay. So you wouldn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness, would you? Well, certainly the, the one that translated their Bible and changed it in John chapter 1 to uh, diminish Jesus. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So this passage contains a strong admonition not to tamper with any part of God's word. And since Revelation is tied into both the Old and New Testaments, this warning covers the entire Bible. Christine and I had an experience, I won't say the church we used to go to, but Christine was brought up in it. And when we were, we were married? Yeah, after we mar were married, wasn't it? Came back to New Zealand from the ship. We were going to this church and one day the pastor got up and told us why the book of Daniel shouldn't have been included in the Bible. And I looked at Christine and she looked at me and, and we said, we're out of here. Once you start pulling books out of the Bible, well, there's no end to that. If you don't accept the Bible as your authority, well, anything's possible. So we looked at each other and said, no, we're out of here as quick as you can, you know. Why? Because tampering with the Bible. You just can't do that. You don't have the authority to do that. Declaring that part of the word has been done away with or that certain portions are not for us today is tampering with the word. Such action is flirting with disaster. Okay, there's some pretty strong words there. So he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so. Come, Lord Jesus. And the very last verse of the Bible, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? You know, the, the, the last verse of the Bible would have to be an important one, wouldn't it? You know, we've been teaching a lot about grace. And, and what does it say? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So the most important last thought that God wanted to leave us with at the close of the Bible was what? That the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will be with us always. Awesome, eh? So the revelation closes on a high note. It assures us of Jesus' glorious return and reminds us that his love is constantly with us while we await the event. Let us grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord unto full maturity in which there are no divisions and enjoy unity of faith and complete knowledge of the Son of God. Finished. <laughs> Yay.
Praise God. Wow, we made it. <laughs> we only really scratched the surface, but I think it's given you a bit of an overview, at least of some of the main events as we track through. And uh, Revelation's a lot better than some people thought, isn't it? It really is a great book. You know, blessed is he who reads and understands and hears the prophecy. So, um, you know, hopefully that's changed your view of Revelation and end time events. It's really something to look forward to for us, isn't it? And it's motivation too for people that don't know the Lord, for us to make sure that um, they have an opportunity to, to know the Lord and accept Jesus. I mean, there's got some people that are going to be really, uh, really down on themselves if they don't receive Jesus. Praise God. Jump up on your feet and let's have a, have a prayer. Hallelujah. <laughs> the grace of the Lord. Praise God. Thank God for His grace. Amen. We're saved by grace. We're saved through faith. That's the only reason we get to go up in the rapture. God's favor is already upon us. He's smiling at us. We walk in the light of his countenance already. And we're just here to give him pleasure, aren't we? You know, Just to give him pleasure. Hallelujah. I don't think God has pleasure with religious people that are trying so hard to earn his love and deserve his acceptance. And I think God just loves people that say, God, I just need everything about you. Amen. God, I've got nothing to offer, but what I have that's good, I receive from you. You know? Our sufficiency is from Him. It's all from Him. And we just give Him pleasure by believing that, by receiving it, and just simply fellowshipping with Him. Hallelujah. Father, we thank You tonight. We just thank You for this awesome prophecy of revelation that John received and well, in, well into his late sunset years of his life. And Father, we thank You that these words were preserved for us to read and be blessed as we read it 2,000 years later. And Father, it's exciting for us to think that we could be among the last of the generations and that we eagerly await your return. And Father, we just thank you that just reading these words puts an assurance in our heart that, Father, that you have a plan to take us right through to new heavens, new earth and new Jerusalem. And that, Father, we certainly have a hope and a future, not just on this planet, but for all eternity. It's just going to be absolutely awesome. And Father, it helps put things in perspective for us. Sometimes this earthly life presents itself as the be-all and end-all. And Father, we know that it's not. We know that our life here is just a vapor. It's just a breath. It's just a short time, Father. But we're thankful for it. And Lord, you said to occupy until you come. So Lord, we're we're going to work according to the grace given to us. You're going to continue to order our steps. And Father, just like our sister shared tonight, there are things inside of us that are ready to come out. (laughs) That we're not going to be among the cowardly and the unbelieving of revelation. But Father, we're going to be those that that know that we're loved. That know that we're overcomers and more than conquerors. That we have a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Hallelujah. And Father, it's our time to step up and step out. It's our time to arise and shine for our light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are here tonight. We are here tonight to serve, Father, to serve your purpose and serve in your kingdom. And, Father, just loose a boldness on us tonight, Lord. Father, loose a confidence on us tonight, Lord. Father, loose a fresh grace on us tonight to step out and to fulfill the things that, Father, you've called us to do, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 